Between the ages of 18 and 21, I used to spend at least probably two of my weekends out of the month locked up in the watch house from fighting and doing crazy shit because I was just an angry little shit. And I started to become aware of all these things and work on my shit and become aware of people and understanding human behavior and psychology and neuroscience and all these things and working on my business and doing those types of things. So this has been a nine year journey in the making here. So welcome to a Road Less Doubtful podcast. Today I have Morgan T. Nelson. Like you are a specialist in neuro-linguistics programming, which is just training the brain and getting outside of you, getting overcoming self-doubt. Hold the belief that's possible. Get around people that are actually share the same beliefs as you and then invest in mentorship. Learn from people that have done the things. This is why I run all these programs I run. It's like be okay with being the dumbest person in the room, right? That's one of the things I did for a long time. Welcome to a Road Less Doubtful podcast, leaning into the parts of you that have been hidden away. I'm your host, Emily Wilson. So welcome to a Road Less Doubtful podcast. Today, I have Morgan T. Nelson. Now, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to put the T in there. Morgan, does that make you more important? The Morgan T. Nelson part. That was my first question that I wanted to know. That's funny. Funny you say, so when I first started out and like really building my personal brand, um, I, I was thinking, I was like, I, I wanted to, you know, because personal branding and marketing 101 is like, you need to get attention, you know, get attention and keep attention. So I was thinking, Morgan Nelson is just such a boring name. I'm like, it's so, it's so like just plain, you know, it's not like a Elon Musk, not a Richard Branson or anything like this. And then I, I knew of T. Harv Eker. Um, who was like a famous author and speaker and stuff. And that was his name, T. Harvecker. I'm like, what the fuck is the T stand for? And the T stands for the, the Harvecker. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's pretty hilarious. That's not what mine stands for. But I got the idea of like, I want to give some type of edge. So I'm like, what if I just put the initial of my middle name in there, Morgan T. Nelson, it gives us some edge. And then I was just thinking a few weeks ago, I was like, you know what, Morgan Nelson is actually a pretty unfamiliar name anyway. So I've kind of done a bit of a full circle and maybe I'll remove it from the name, but it was purely a brand move to uh, have something sort of create some edge and stand out a bit more. Fair enough. Well, Morgan the Nelson, uh, welcome. Oh, it's not <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But I really like it. And I was trying to like type up and research and I was like having a look at a few things before I came on because obviously you're... Well, not obviously, you're actually only my second person that I've interviewed on this podcast. And this is a very new jump in and it's actually a personal experiment for me, this podcast. This is really about getting comfortable and learning to use my voice and stepping outside my comfort zone, which as the title suggests is is the thing, right? Stepping outside a doubt and um, deciding that I had something to say. But when I was researching you, as I was like writing notes down, I'm like Morgan Nelson. Oh, it doesn't look right. And so I would like backspace and I'd put Morgan T. Nelson in. And I'm like, okay, that that sounds so much better. So um, anyway, thank you for doing it with me. Um, you did kind of get railroaded into it, but that's okay. That <laughs> I'm glad you're there yeah. anyway for you. Um, and in true form, I had to like you are a specialist in neuro-linguistics programming, which is just a really, really fancy word for training the brain and getting outside of your, getting, overcoming self-doubt, right? Yes, pretty much. So, so, so if we look at, if we look at what NLP is, like neuro-linguistic program, if we break it down into the language, so neuro meaning your neurology, um, which is, which our brain 100% can be reprogrammed. It doesn't matter which age you are. I was having a conversation with Simone and my partner last night and she's like, it's so crazy that in school, I was told that after you get past a certain age, about 15 to 18, they were telling her that your brain stops developing and that's it, period. You can't learn anything more. And it's complete and utter shit. And there's been decades of science to show now that we can actually reprogram our mind using neuroplasticity and reprogram the neurons and the neurology and our nervous system and all these types of things and literally recreate and reinvent ourselves in a very short amount of time as well. So for the people that may be listening to this that do doubt themselves a little bit, that's totally fine because you are not, you know, it, it doesn't matter what you're doing and who you are right now, it matters who you choose to actually want to become in the future. And at every single moment in our life, we can make the decision to want to turn that chapter and rewrite our new story. 
And it's only a problem if we want to rewrite a new story and still bring the old character into the story. You know, like if you look at any incredible movie, the, the character is continually evolving and getting better. Even Harry Potter. You look at the first Harry Potter movie. He's this weird little kid. And then eventually he figures out he's got these powers and blah, blah, blah. And he takes on this big fucking dude, right? Um, so the whole story of life really should be to continually transform and become a better version of us. Now we just need to learn the skills and equip ourselves with the tools to do that. So neuro, neurology, linguistic, so all about our language. Language is literally, we would have nothing without language because how would you describe anything? Including doubt. How would you know you have doubt if you didn't know doubt was doubt? How would we know this? So linguistic, like ling linguistics is literally what will create and destroy all of our problems. People label things. Well, I have anxiety. I have depression. I am doubtful. I am not confident. And they'll, they'll create labels and they'll linguistically actually embed this into their psyche. And our unconscious mind doesn't know the difference between what's real and what's fake. The things that we focus on seem real to us. So if we use language in a way that we say we have this thing or I am this, I am that or whatever, then our unconscious mind thinks it's real, gives meaning to it, and our will will actually act out the behavior as if it's real. For example, I often get people to pretend that they're eating a lemon. I'm like, get a slice of lemon, stick in your mouth and bite it down. And, and their mouth goes like, ugh. And, and they get weird, right? Like you are right now. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> But, but we haven't actually put a lemon in our mouth. So our unconscious mind, what it imagines, it doesn't know if it's real or not. So then our body reacts. So if we say things to ourselves just with language alone, I'm unconfident, I'm doubting myself, then our mind goes, okay, well, how do I do doubt? What does doubt feel like? What does it look like? And then how do I do the action of doubt? You know, so linguistics. So reprogramming the mind for our neurology using language uh, and then programming neuro-linguistic programming so rewriting the neurology using language uh and a little bit more as well you know because every single problem we have is actually held in by language uh held in by the bounds of our beliefs and our beliefs have been installed by language um you know and if we even think back to you know the ancient times of ancient egyptians ancient hunas uh and all these people that sort of come well 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 before us they would use spelling right? And they would cast spells, right? So a spell back in the day, they would literally, I, I just got back from visiting a city in England called Bath. Uh, and, and I was doing all this um, touristy stuff. And they were showing that how there was this wishing pond. And what they used to do back then, they would actually write down on this uh, piece of metal or whatever. And they would write down the, what's the things like, they want to what, what's the word I'm looking for? Where they, they want to actually like say something wrong about somebody. I really, I'm forgetting the word right here. They'll write down, like, I wish, like this person stole from me. So the person who stole from me, I'm wishing that you die and blah, blah, blah. And they would literally put these spells, these intentions into a thing and throw into the world. Well, so everything has come back from uh, the intention behind language. There's been so many tests on this as well. There's, there's even been, um, there's a Japanese scientist, what he did was, he got a whole bunch of water, okay? The water was in one jug, so the same water, one jug. And what he did was he poured the same water into multiple different cups. And underneath the cup, he wrote a word. And he wrote love, he wrote hate, jealousy. He even wrote like swears. He wrote like fuck. He wrote kind. And what they did, and they sat the water on top of these words for like a week. Then they took the water out, put it in the petri dish, looked underneath a microscope, and every single molecule was different from each other. That doesn't make sense. Like it's all from the same jar, right? But you get the one that looked like love and under the microscope, it looked like loving and fluffy and just joyful. You see the angry one and it would look jagged like cut ice. And and then that just, you know, really makes you think of how much language or just the power of the intention, everything behind it really, really has on it. So that's a bit of a uh, breakdown, I guess, of NLP. It's, you know, it's not really my only thing though, but I, I've definitely sort of obsessed into that. I've become an NLP trainer. I've, you know, I've trained close to probably 100,000 people around the world now in uh, mindset and sort of helping them break through um, beliefs and doubts and all their past programming that have shaped them to who they are now. Um, but yeah. 
I'm going to go more down the path of how you got to where you are now um, because you said the word there's many different chapters and I have a thing that like you know you have this chapter two moment I think we probably have lots of chapters lots of moments um, but there's usually a defining moment that that clicks you over into that next thing but I still want to stay on on this a little bit because I love that because you think it's so easy to to choose the wrong word and inhabit and just it flows out of your mouth and I catch myself doing it all the time and sometimes it seems so easy to want uh it seems so easy to just change your your language and and everything else changes but it seems too simple so people don't bother doing it sometimes something so simple they don't bother with because I know I've practiced that with the, the children I've taken the jars of rice and we put them side by side on the bench and we've um, done the positive affirmations and said loving words to one jar of rice. And then we've done the other jar of rice and we've said really, really mean words to it and yucky words, like the things that they will call their sisters because I've got the three girls. And I'm like, see what this does. Like, you know, you can't take it back. And then within no time, those words that were spoken bad, that rice goes brown and moldy and yuck. And the other one stays white and crisp and wow. mellow. And it's how long did it take? How long did that experiment take? To see those results. So I would say you saw within a few days the brown, the white rice going brown and yuck. You started noticing traces of that, but you could get that white rice that you had, like you know, and it's cooked, so it's going to go moldy pretty quick. You would have thought, but by saying the kind words to it, it stays white for such a long time, and it really does show, like the energy, like you said, the intention. And energy and like energy is in everything and soon as you grasp that as well and I mean I know we're talking language but I think energy as well is huge because then when you change the language even when you say the word doubt I noticed even in me you sort of want to slump a little it's not a powerful word so straight away you want to slump because it doesn't feel good and so then your energy changes straight away so you know Things like that. Like I know coming on here, I was like, how do I make myself feel, and I'm going to use the word worthy, of sitting here and doing this interview because I've never done one before. So how am I going to show up as me and stay in my lane and do a job that I'm proud of? And then I was thinking about it and I'm like, well, if I use language that overinflates you, that's going to underinflate me. Like, mm deflate me right so like I'm putting you up on a pedestal and I was like Dr. John D. Martini I've read this before and you've interviewed him right so I'm like if I put you on a pedestal automatically I feel down here because I've overinflated what you're capable of and that's not to say I don't think you're amazing but if I do that I'm really undervaluing me and not exactly. seeing it's my good things and that happens a lot yeah it's exactly, exactly what you say. It's not not to take away anything from the person, but it's to actually raise yourself up. And, and you know, I, I think starting a podcast is, and I said this to you before we started, it's incredible that you're doing it because I learned so much about myself when I started my podcast because I was the same when I started reaching out to guests I thought were killing it in life. And I was like, who am I to bring this person on? And I learned the exact same thing of not pedestaling people and seeing them the exact same. They're still people. Everyone's doing things. And, um, yeah, so I, I learned a lot about my self-worth as well. Um, but one thing I, lo I love that you said, and this is what people can really take, because nothing in this life is is really anything other than the very moment in which we're experiencing right now. That's it. So if we're going to look at really how to create an extraordinary quality of life, we've really got to break it down and go, well, what does it take to create the most extraordinary moment now? And then how can I continually repeat that? And you see, I've met people, I met people where I'm like, put, you know, put up your hand if, if you've experienced any moments of, of being sad or angry and people, the hands go up, put up your, keep up your hand if, if the moments have lasted a week and the hands up a month. And then I've had one person say, oh, I've been pissed off for years. Wow. <laughs> that's just, that's so insane to believe that you've been so angry for every single one of those moments for the last few years. I, I, I actually don't believe it. Because there's definitely moments where you probably had sex at least. At least I'd hope. <laughs> I would like hope. Horrible, horrible sex. Yeah, right. But at least at least one of those moments you're like, hey, this might be good. Oh, 
Oh, no, no, it wasn't. But hey, there was one moment there where you had hope, right? And so what happens is when people will, people can get into this spiral of continually recycling their past because they continually look back, like everyone's looking for self-trust. Like we, we need self-trust. The, the, the amount of things that you can actually tap into and create and do in your life comes down to the level that you can trust yourself. That's it. This is why I jump out of airplanes. Because one, like one of the, the, the biggest things I learned when I threw myself out of the airplane the first time with nothing but a fucking backpack, and this isn't tandem, this is solo diving, right? Was I learned that if there's ever going to be a moment I need to trust myself, it's now. Because I it's need to. It's funny. So funny you say that because I that was something I wanted to talk to you about. So I'm going to cut you off and I apologize about yeah. this conversation, right? So I listened to you doing that podcast and I was like, oh my God, that's me. Because at 21, and I'm 40 next year, so at 21, I jumped out of a plane for my 21st. I was like, right, I'm going to do this and I'm going to get all of my jumps so that I can do this myself. No, was still on cruise ships, came back, never did it. Um, May this year, I was looking at a paraglider um, in Caloundra and I'm like, if he lands on the top of a cliff, I'm jumping off. I'm going to ask him if he will take me and I'm going to jump. And he landed and I said, would you take me? And he's like, yeah, like I've got a tandem pack in the car. So strapped myself on and I jumped off the cliff. No problem, loved it, best conversation. And we stayed in contact, whatever. So incredible. But my takeaway from that was, holy fuck, I just trusted a complete stranger with my life and didn't give it a second thought. But I don't know that I would jump off that cliff and trust myself to pack that parachute and go. And so that's my next goal for that reason. And so, yeah, it is. Everything is about that self-trust. Well, but that's the thing. Like, I, I wouldn't trust a parachute that I've packed either. I don't, I don't pack my parachutes. I get professionals to do it, right? Um, because, you get but to a point that you do, yes, but I'm okay. not at that point yet, but I'm not at the point, right? Cause I'm at, cause if I had to learn how to jump out of an airplane safely, parachute, uh, t- free fall safely, pull the parachute out safely, par- like parachute and land safely and learn how to pack my shit at the end, it's overwhelming. It's too much, you know? So to get my B license, it does require me having to learn how to pack my chute. But, um, but here's the thing. So you said you don't trust yourself in order to pack your own shoot. And so you shouldn't because you don't have the experience yet for it. And that's a pretty big thing. But here's the thing. Do you, you trust, and this is for everyone listening, it doesn't matter if you believe in yourself at the moment when you're just starting. It does not matter if you just believe, if you don't believe in yourself. What matters is that you believe, A, that it's possible. That is it possible for you to be able to pack a parachute, for example? Is it possible for you to be able to get out there and start your own business? Is it possible for you to be able to get out there and speak to an audience? Is it possible to do whatever it is that may be completely scary? And the answer is, of course it's possible. Of course it's possible. Great, so that's one belief. And the second belief, which is the most important, is if it's important enough to me, am I able to learn the skill set and the mindset in order to get it done? And that belief should be absolutely true as well. Because now it's just a matter of, well, is it important enough for you? Yeah, okay. So it's, if it's important enough for you to start your own business and get out there and and or start your own podcast or get on stage and speak, if that's enough, in, if that's important enough for you, then now it's a matter of going great. Well, I just need to learn the skill set and the mindset that that requires me to do that thing. Once you have the courage to take the first step towards that, confidence will follow. People will go to sleep at night hoping that they'll wake up in the morning with confidence. It'll never happen. This is why I love, like, and I'm going to put together a program of, of um, skydiving because it's, it's, it's such an incredible way to sort of teach, teach people not only just fear, it's actually got nothing to do with fear, but it's, it's, it's a complete self-trust thing because like that, so that's, that's the main thing, right? But let me, let me show you the, the biggest thing I kind of got from um, skydiving. When I, I, I always wanted to do it. I, I, I'm, I don't know, I'm just a bit of a sick fuck. I like, I like adrenaline things. And I like, to, I like to find the line of this could be really good or this could be really bad. And for me, that's just really exciting. And I get up there, day one learning how to parachute is they sit you in a tin shed, 40 degree heat, um, 
about eight or nine hours for the whole day and you're learning through a PowerPoint presentation TV that was shot in the fucking 80s. So it's the most mind-numbing shit you could ever believe. And they're showing you all the different ways that you can die skydiving <laughs> and, the, and the one way how to fix it. The song going through my head is like, dumb way to die. When starting my journey of self-discovery, I felt alone and lost. That's why I'm so incredibly dedicated to this podcast and passionate about building you a place of community to help you remember exactly who you were before life got in the way. So with that said, word of mouth is one way we can grow this community. So please share this with your friends and family. And so you don't miss an episode, I'd love for you to tap the subscribe button. Now, let's get back to the episode. Yeah, right? And, and, and I'm like trying to not freak out and they're showing us all these things. And then like, okay, cool. Now let's go tandem parachute. Oh my goodness. Now I know there's all these ways that we can have a malfunction and all these things. I'm like, line twists. I never knew that you could pull your parachute out and the whole thing can be twisted up. I never knew that was a thing. And I was like, whoa, right? So anyway, the next day I go to sleep that night. I call, I call my missus that night and I say, hey, look, I'm not sure about this whole skydiving thing now. Like, you know, I've lived a really cool life. And I'm just not sure if I really need to learn this skill. Like, it's just not really doing it for me. Like, it's pretty, seems like the risk to reward things just doesn't really add up for me. And and she's like, well, come home then because you're really strong with your intuition and, and all this. And I'm like, well, hang on, just let me sleep on it because I don't know if it's my intuition or if it's just my body saying, this is fucking scary. And I've never experienced that level of fear before because it's a pretty intense fear because the next day I'm solo parachuting now. I've done my whole day learning tomorrow. You're jumping out by yourself. Like, fuck me. I go to sleep. I wake up the next day and I'm still freaking out a little bit. I barely slept that night. And I asked off the question. I'm like, Morgan, what are you so worried about? So I'm like, I, I like heights. I like this adrenaline stuff. What are you so worried about? And the answer was, well, what if I don't open up my parachute? And I'm having a conversation with myself down. I'm like, why would I not open up my parachute? It's so dumb. And I'm like, yeah, but I know. I, of course you want to, but it's still a possibility. Like, what if that's just a thing? And then it hit me. I'm like, oh, right. So it's not a matter of you being scared of the heights or jumping out of the plane or anything. You're afraid of trusting yourself to do what's necessary in the moment of chaos. And I'm like, oh my God. You know? And it hit me. So I got my shit together. I put my backpack on. And I'm like, I'm going to do it. Because all I know I need to do is take one step of courage and then the evidence in the real time will show to me that I'm capable of doing what's necessary and I'll build confidence as I'm actually going down. And then all I need to do is actually be prepared and know the things that, that I do know within. So I did all the things. I took my parachute out. I, I parachuted down. I landed. As soon as I got on the floor, it was just like a big <laughs> fuck yes. And I've been absolutely hooked ever since. Because now... I built more confidence. You see, confidence, people people think they would just get confident and they're focused on the wrong thing. They shouldn't be focusing on building confidence. They should be focusing on building evidence that there's somebody that does shit when most people don't. If you want to become a confident speaker on stage, you're not just going to wake up one day and go, I'm now confident enough to do it. You'll probably do it and go, I'm, I'm a little fucking scared. And that's okay. I'm going to take a step of courage. I'm going to get out there. I'm going to do it. And then when I finish, you're like, wow, I have more confidence now because that's just another piece of evidence to show me that I can actually do it. Same as when you do these podcasts. Every podcast, you become more and more confident, not really because you're getting better, but more so because you're reinforcing the fact that you did it. So you're not just going to go, I'm a confident interviewer now. You're going to say, well, I've done 100 episodes. And I've got a hundred episodes of evidence that's just now. And that's, that's the main thing. If you're somebody who has got drive and determination and grit and all of those things, and I want to be better and I want to uh, dig deep and look inside yourself, you're always going to reevaluate, reevaluate where you're at anyway. So like you just said, if I'm at a hundred episodes and I'm sure you're probably the same or my assumption is you would be, You'll get to that, but you'll still be looking going, where could I do more, be better, change, grow? And if you're not, there's probably something kind of wrong with that anyway. So for me, I've found 
and maybe this, you know, this is your world. But I had my chapter two moment and it kicked me in the ass. And so I had to, I had to show up. There was like a moment of, I have to do this now. I don't have a choice. But then that evidence, like you just said, started stacking. I'm like, oh, I can earn the money. I can do this. I can show up. And then it started turning into, I love that feeling. So I'm going to do that a little bit more. And then it started outweighing the other evidence that I had built that was on the other side of that, that I'd built for the 30 odd years beforehand. And so anytime I need to show up in here or at work or wherever, let's say it's going to be the paragliding eventually, I'll be able to take this part of the evidence and go, where have I seen that before where I have been able to, even when my mind's reverting back to the keep it safe version, right? Well, what will happen is you'll revert back to, because what it is, <clears throat> is self-trust is built on the other side of, as cliche as it sounds, the comfort zone. Because what happens is when we're, when we're in our comfort zone and we're doing things where we are confident with, capable at, we're not building any of that self-trust because it's just, it's, it's normal. Um, you know, when you're driving your car, you know, you, you don't, it's, it's just normal. But if you took your car into a racetrack, you're going to be like, oh my God, this is nuts. And then someone teaches you how to drift it around a corner and maybe you're a bit shit at the start, but it's a bit scary. And you're not very comfortable doing it, but you do it a lot and a lot and a lot. The next time you get back on the road, you'll have this, uh, this self-trust within you that if someone swerved in front of you, you'd probably have a lot more skills behind you now as a driver to be able to stay safe, right? The first one I've ever used that as an example, I hope it made sense. Because what happens is in our comfort zone, we're not, we're not developing more self-trust. Every time we do something outside of our comfort zone, we go out there, we do that whole courage thing, build confidence, and it almost like it brings it back and it says to us, shit, it actually wasn't as bad as what I thought. So now I've got more experience, I've got more evidence, and I've got more layers of self-trust for if anything like that ever happens again. That's why I really I really have, like, and we teach us at our advanced leadership program, like we do things, we put people under tremendous, uh, tremendous stress or pressure um, to help expand their nervous system really quickly so that if they experience anything similar to that ever again, then they're actually equipped, they're familiar with it, and they know how to handle themselves under pressure. And it, it all comes down to a self-trust thing. So <clears throat> developing more self-trust will literally be the keys to creating the, an incredible quality of life that you actually want. But in order to create the self-trust, it comes down to doing micro things that are outside of our comfort zone. That's yeah. why I, I think everybody should have, as, that's why I love the, the, the podcast. Like do something that's different. Do something, everyone should do something different every year than they've ever done before. Like try a new thing. Try a new hobby. Go start dancing. Like I, I've become a salsa and bachata dancer. Never thought about it, but I just did it and I liked it. And I can dance. I can skydive. I can play some musical instruments. Not very well, but I just like to do this shit because I'm like, if I'm ever put on a reality TV show on an island somewhere and, and the only way that I can get off is to be able to play a song, then I got a pretty fucking good chance now because I've just, you know what I mean? Completely irrelevant, but the, the key is but I've got showing really your way. <laughs> yeah, right? But not shying away from things that may be a little bit uncomfortable because through the, through the comfort creates self-trust. I think that has become something that has been, it's a narrative societally, I think that is a word, that we have been told that we're not allowed to change who we are. We have an identity, we grew up, we became this, we went into this job, and then we're supposed to stay that way. And right. And then I think people get really scared to go and then try these new things and different outfits on. But it's really, really fun when you can get past that. But that's what I'm slowly discovering. And I'm still like, I'm still very much in it. And it will, you know, it's the forever peeling back, you know, like the donkey off of Shrek. It's like peel those layers back kind of, kind of yeah, yeah. analogy. But like you said, I started playing the guitar tried the ukulele, I get the shits pretty quick. I'm a very impatient person, so I want it all now, but I've just got to keep trying. And that's a mental thing that you're going to have to help me with. I'll have to come do one of your courses. But it's those sorts of things. Studying human design has been really cool for me because, again, it's a new thing and it's coming back to that self-trust. And I think there's so many things out there like what you do 
all of these different coaches. And it, again, it's not to put that down because you need those tools very, very much. But you could tell me what to do, but what if it doesn't feel right for me, right? Like if it doesn't feel right for me, I still then have to have this innate self-trust that I still want to do something my way. I'll take your advice on board and then go, does it feel right for me to do it? Like you could be like, Emily, go jump out of the plane because that's going to grow you so much. And then you can go and do a hundred podcasts and it's going to be easy. And that's what you should do, right? But to me, I'll be like, oh, it's not feeling really quite aligned with what I have built in here. So I'd like to maybe expand on that in technical terms, maybe. Yeah, I love talking this because that's the thing. It's the language, right? So first things first is I can make you do anything if I want to do it, <laughs> right? <clears throat> right. And, 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 and that's the thing. So if, if you come to me and you're like, I want to challenge that. <laughs> try it. Right. So if, if, if you come to me and you're like, Morgan, I, I really want to have more business growth. And I say, well, how come you, you've been struggling so far? You're like, well, you know, I really want to open up more, more franchises and put myself out there more. I say, well, how come you haven't done it? So, well, I'm just worried about what people think of me. Cool. Where else are you worried? about what people are gonna think. Where else are you scared? Where else is fear in general stopping you from doing the things you really want? And you say, well, fuck you everywhere. I say, well, yeah, I'd think so. Cool, so now you've got an option. Now you're aware, key one. Now you're aware that the thing stopping you is is the fear. Great. Second one is, how much longer do you wanna play with this for? Do you wanna, do you wanna stay here a little bit longer? Another five years? Or do you wanna have radical change right now and completely transform who you believe you are at the core? and start building your business. And then suppose you're probably like, well, yeah, I kind of want that. Great. Let's jump and have an airplane, right? Because if you can do, how we do one thing is how we do everything. So if you can learn some skill set, and obviously I'm not just going to do that, right? But if we were to do that, and if I take, if I build a program that teaches people how to jump and have an airplane, we're, we're going to teach people how to really regulate their nervous system so they can control that off feeling that you said. You're like, well, it doesn't feel right. It shouldn't feel right. That's the, that's, the fear or that's the comfort zone. That's the unknown. That's the, fuck, this doesn't feel right. I've never been here before. It's unfamiliar or well, perfect. That means you're on the right track of a breakthrough. That means you're on the right track of expansion. Because if you only did things that felt right, you wouldn't fucking do anything. This is the issue I have with the whole conscious community these days. Because they're always like, oh, but it just doesn't feel right. I'm like, well, stay broke, stay unhappy and stay mediocre. Like that's, that's the reality. If you're only ever going to do the things that feel <laughs> right, then you'll never really amount to anything. Because I tell you, the how I know I'm on the right track is when my nervous system's going, fuck, this is scary. Amazing. Lean into it. It's tension. You cannot expand without tension. Imagine if you went to the gym and you're like, I want to turn into a sexy motherfucker. I want to grow my booty. I want to do the biceps and I want to do all this stuff. But I'm not going to put my muscles under pressure. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna strain my muscles. What do you mean? But when I pick up this weight, it hurts. Oh, my, my muscles hurt the next day. This must. This, this. This doesn't feel right. Well, great. Do that, and you'll stay exactly where you are, right? So yes, there's some truth to this. There's there's some truth, but I I don't believe many people understand the difference between um, intuitive alignment and just what's uncomfortable. I really yeah. believe a lot. I of people... definitely am talking about intuitive alignment. And what's under, there is a definite, there is a definite difference there, but I understand exactly what you were saying as well on that, because it is very easy to stay comfortable and sell yourself. There was moments where I sold myself. So in my marriage, I haven't said this very much, but I sold myself with gratitude. I am grateful that I have Someone who will go get the milk, someone who'll make breakfast is well, whatever, that's not even a word. Make breakfast for the kids. So I could <laughs> I could sell myself on gratitude and being happy, which was me going, uh uh-uh. uh, like I wasn't actually happy and fulfilled, but I could stay there based on that. Right. And that's still not leaving my comfort zone. So that's just another way to wrap up that that same model. Well, let me ask you a question. When you how long did you stay in the marriage before uh, after you knew you shouldn't have stayed there? 
a very long time because I'm now a recovering people pleaser who can fix right. everything. And I have a lot of grit, Morgan. Yeah. So I am going to say five years. Right. So five years. And five if you had a, years. so if you had a, the moment you realize this is not it, mm -hmm. would, would you say, safe to say that if you had have gone to him and said, Hey, I'm over it. I can't do it then that mm -hmm. probably would have felt really hard to do. You know, your body would have been like screamed at you. This is fucking scary. Absolutely. Right? So see the correlation. But you knew it was right for you, but it wasn't easy. But so also why. I could almost then put that back into kind of what I was saying because I also knew intuitively at that, like my gut was screaming at me and there was a point where I was like, I know. And now I've been able to hold on to that feeling with everything else I've done. And I can go, my gut says, freaking go jump. My gut says, do this podcast. I'm ready. And I don't give my, I do sometimes, but I have to catch myself. I don't give my brain the time yeah. to kick in and change my mind and change my gut response. Yeah. So pretty much like, so it's our nervous system freaking out. Okay. So now, now let's, and the time, let's just, cause we're on the topic of the marriage, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously there came a time when you were like, Okay, I'm done, I'm done now. It just took five years, okay? And it was probably still a hard decision. It was probably really still hard to go through that. And it probably really would have been harder to do it sooner, possibly. And that time may have given you more evidence and more leverage to go, I'm fucking done, right? But if you were to be in a new relationship now and you start to see things that you're like, that's not someone I want to be with, do you think you've now got more strength to call it off sooner. Yeah. Of course. So through the tension, through the uncomfortable feeling, through the experiences, through doing what was hard, you've now got more wisdom, more strength. But it's not it's not a uh, like fuck you strength. It's a I know who I am, I know my boundaries, and I know what I want, and this is not it. And that's still an uncomfortable conversation. It is. Right? Because you've so so really it's about Let's take somebody, <clears throat> I, I draw this thing, right? This is how I explain, this is why the more personal development we do, uh, the, the better everyone's life is going to be pretty much, right? Because it's, if, if, if there's a level five problem here, but as a level two person, it, it's a big problem. It's a humongous problem. But if it's a level five problem, a level eight person, it's a very little problem. Mm -hmm. Same problem, different person. And I like to think about that of the expansion of your nervous system. Because now when I look at, and you definitely as a business owner as well, right? You put yourself in your shoes 10 years ago, be able to handle some of the stress you go through in the business. Maybe 10 years ago, you'd be like, I couldn't do it. But through the consistency of overcoming hard things, doing hard tasks, the stress, the, the failures, the setbacks, the grit, the pushing, the uncomfortable conversations, the getting up when you didn't want to do it, doing all these things has built you and expanded you into this person that when you see a level five problem, you're like, it's easy. Someone left the business, easy. Just, you know what I mean? I remember the first time someone quit my business, I was like, fuck, the whole business is gone. Now I'm like, oh, it's just a Tuesday. <laughs> you know? Really, you've had, and, it, and it doesn't phase me as much. And that's the whole idea of doing things that are hard. So that there's the underlying thing. So it's not just the whole, I just like to use the airplane as an analogy because a lot of people just have the fear about it. Yeah. Sometimes I've told people to go jump out of an airplane and they do it too easy. I'm like, fuck, maybe I'll go take you, I don't know, dancing, <laughs> right? Because everyone's got their thing, right? Everyone's got their thing that, but when they're, quite often when you're faced with some level of resistance, that is what you should lean into because it's going to expand you more and more and more. However, this advice probably isn't for every single person. Everybody has different thresholds at different points. Let's say if someone's listening to this right now and they've had nothing but 20 years of... Uh, abuse, domestic violence, um, narcissistic behavior. Like let, let's just say that they're 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 so crushed, you know, internally, and they don't believe their, you know, their self esteem is very low, their self confidence is very low. And then I say to this person, hey, get out there and just go ask that person at the bar for a date. They'll probably shut down so much. Or let's say if I say, hey, get up on get up on stage and deliver a speech to an audience, their nervous system because it's shrunken so much, because now it's just trying to keep them in survival. It's like, I'm just trying to get through a fucking day. I don't want to care. I don't need a hundred eyeballs looking at me, judging me, right? 
So in order to put them on stage, for example, it may be the hardest thing in the world to do. But then let's say if I take somebody like you, who's like a badass bitch, gone through all these things. And you were just talking about. So I've got questions, so keep going. Oh, okay, okay. No, 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 go, go. Or we take you, or we take the person you are in six months. Because what I'm getting at is you're doing the things. Mm. You looked at you looked at starting a podcast and you told me from the start, this is gonna be some growth for me. Like and that's why you're doing it. Because it's not easy. You're like, but I'm leaning into it. Yeah. And so that you are you who you are in six months will look back on who you are now and go. I'm so glad of, of who I've become. However, the things that you will be capable of doing in six months to who you are right now will be totally different. And if I was to push you and say to you, everybody here should just go jump and have an airplane to face their fears, some people might go, that, I can't even comprehend that. It's not a fear thing. It's literally a survival thing. My nervous system can't allow it. But for a lot of people, they're at the point where they're like, yeah, let's, let's fucking do it. This is making sense. Absolutely. Yeah. It's interesting how you you can change so quickly, but it takes so long at the same time. There's a lag. Hey. There's a, there's a lag. Think yeah. about it like stretching a rubber band, mm. right? You stretch a rubber band, you send it to where you want it to go. And, and you hold that vision, you manifest, you do whatever. You hold the vision, you see it so clearly, you see the life you want to create. But then what happens is eventually, but if you hold the vision for so long, eventually the rubber band has to catch up. Yeah. So there's a there's a lag. And then sometimes it happens really fast. Like it's happened to me. I was just over in, in the UK speaking at this huge event. And these are things that I've called in for years. I've, I want to speak at events like this. I want to meet people like this. Next minute I'm here doing it. And my nervous system was like freaking out, going, who am I to be here? This is weird. It's weird. It's a whole new experience. That was the first time I really, it made so much sense. I'm like, there is a drastic lag. So you call the things in you want, you know what's happening, but then your body, your nervous system, everything catches up where you're like, oh, and it has to come along with the growth. But this is the most important thing with with really expanding and getting to a whole new level. Everyone can redesign their life, reinvent themselves at any moment, hold a brand new vision of yourself and never let it go. And then do things that are hard and life will be easy. But if you do things that are easy, life will be hard and the vision will become a, a distant memory of the past. And then it comes back to that trust because, again, like I had my chapter two moment, which was I had a couple. I mean, I freaking broke my jaw and fell face first to a floor uh, in a foreign country. Couple drinks. Hey. Couple of drinks. Up to kill something. None. No fun story. It was actually for business. And I thought I would never see my kids again. And that, you know, that changes you for a, for a moment, right? And then you can go, ah. Oh, I'm past it and you go about your life and then the marriage ended I was like I'm done with I'm done with playing small I've always had this inner grit this inner determination but I never let it out because I had a fear of being too much to this to that to all of the things and so I guess what I'm gonna do there is a question in this so uh, my step was into network marketing and the reason I did it was because I thought I was going to get so much judgment and I wanted that to come at me because I wanted I wanted the income because I went from a two-person income and raising three kids and holding my house and I was determined that that was staying and I was going to keep running my business and I had a vision for travel and freedom and I never wanted that to go. I was like, no way, I'm not going to be the mum that just sits around the house and washes the dishes because it is not who I am. And I was like, but how do I get from where I am to where I want to be? And I had no clue, but I was the person that you were kind of describing because I was quite, I'm not, I don't even want to say the word, but I had no evidence that I could step into my power because I had squashed that for so long. I was so quietened and I thought every time I used my voice or every time I spoke up, it wasn't okay. It wasn't heard. And so I was like, how hell am I going to go and sell something on social media and speak and make this money and I'm going to cry and that's like bloody hell no I'm not and so I was like how am I going to step into something and have all of these people tell me you're being stupid it's abroad you can't make money right and I was like but that's the only way I can get over my own self-judgment 
as well and go, I'm fine as me and make some money is having you guys all come at me, right? And so I guess, mm. and then it's been amazing and I've gotten to travel and I've held on to that. And I, in that time, I've built my business and had staff put on, which back then I was like, I can't have staff. I don't want staff. Everyone tells me staff are bad. It's going to be horrible. And now I'm like, I would hate to not have my staff. I freaking love them. They're amazing. So that's what I'm saying about the whole, it can change overnight and feel like it takes so long because then you're like, what's next? Where can we go? And enjoy the journey and enjoy the looking back. And I never really did the looking back and seeing what I had done and giving myself the credit as well. And I think a lot of people maybe need to hear that as well, because it's all a journey. It's not just happiness over there and sadness here. It's like all of the things in between. But my question to you with all of that said is you had your chapter two moment and I would assume one of them is what happened to you. now I'm going to say, was it 21? Am I right? 2019, 21? Well, what happened at, which were you? Who you were <laughs> to? When you thought you might want to take your life. Yeah, 19. 19? I tried to. You tried to, right. And yep. then you stepped into like that network marketing space. And I would just like you to take people on a journey. I'm like, why you chose that? Why? And maybe if you want to share a little bit around what led to that, because I think that's a huge thing from that, because people can look at you and go, easy, right? He's all good. He, yeah. of course, he can jump out of a plane. <clears throat> Yeah, totally. Um, so before I get into that, one thing I just want to say about the judgment, okay? Uh, did you get a lot of judgment or no? In this? If I did... Wait, wait. Now, now how you said you're like, I want people to come at me. Did it happen or not? Not very much. Not very much. No. So we, we, will, we will project out into the world whatever's happening inside of us. So if we ever want to clean up what's actually happening in our external environment, we've got to first look within. So if there's any... You know, if people are worried about judging and people like I, I had this revelation one day I was at an event and I saw every single time they'd put a question, you know, who wants to answer this question? People would pick up the microphone and start talking and I would judge them and I'd be like, look, this fucking person think they're so good. Pick up. There's like 5,000 people in the room, right? I'm like, cause I'm thinking I would never do that. Like, you know, and I was judging them and then I was thinking to myself, I was like, why would I never pick it up? I was like, because everybody would judge me. And I said, well, maybe... I only think they're judging me because I'm judging everybody else. And I joked so, about that when I jumped in because I said I judged people in network marketing because I didn't believe yeah, it. There we go. Yeah. Okay, so it's so then I made a game for the rest of that event. I said, every single time somebody picks up a microphone, I'm going to think of one thing I like about them. Hmm. And before the end of the event, I was picking up the microphone sharing things because I just legitimately believed that other people were looking in for greatness in me as well. And so we can literally clear up our own projection of the world, uh, our own perception of the world, if we clear up our own projections within. Um, so okay. me, 90 years old, yeah, taking lots of drugs, drinking a lot, low self-esteem, low self-worth, um, in, in an abusive, narcissistic kind of work um, environment where I was really controlled. Um, I was an apprentice carpenter, and I got to the point where I literally thought it'd be more painful to stay on this earth than it would be to leave. So I tried to take my own life at 19. And in that process, I realized that I literally have given up on every single thing that my life really stood for before, which was just joy. I'm like, I just want to live a great life. I just want to be happy. I want to travel. I want to smile. I want to laugh. And I gave it all up. So I, I made the decision that moment that nothing will ever be more important than my own happiness ever again. And I moved back down to where I was happy, back back home, back on the Gold Coast. I cleaned myself up. Um, you know, I still partied a lot, you know, but I wasn't as destructive as what I was. Um, it was more so for fun versus advice. And then at 21, I actually started a network marketing business as well. And I actually had no idea what it was. So I didn't go into it with any preconceived ideas or nothing. I just thought, hey, I can make money here. And when I started it, then opened the floodgates of all these people who I thought were my friends being like, oh, pyramid scheme, you're an idiot, you're a loser, you could never do this, who do you think can be successful? I wish I had one person say to me, you'll never become a millionaire. And I'm like, fucking watch me, motherfucker, right? And, um, you know, and, and so I went through years of these things as well. And then I, I, I am very grateful for it because I had to start to learn how to develop thick skin to begin with. But then I think that term in itself is not very useful too, because I'd rather 
because what happens now is I literally haven't had a hater in a very long time. And I've ran out of them because they've all jumped on my side. And they're like, actually, this guy's good. You know, I've ran out of haters because now they follow me and now they're fans. Or they're just dissolved dissolved into the thin air because they're like, fuck, I was an idiot. He actually did do well. Um, but, you know, like like you said, there is the journey. I've been working on myself since 21. I'm 30 now. Listen to my first personal development CD at 21 years old. I started to understand a little bit more about how humans work and some different philosophies to work to live my life by. Like one of my favorite philosophies I learned at 21 was don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. I was like, wow, that's a good one. Stop trying to think the world is doing me bad. Stop trying to stop thinking that, you know, everything out there is bad. And start wishing that I was just a better person to deal with the things that were happening in my life. Kind of everything we've been talking about. It's not the event that's happening to you. It's how you res- uh, respond to the event that happened to you. That's it. A lot of people react. And that's all they do. They react all day through their life. Someone cuts them off in traffic. And they're like, oh my God, this is the worst thing that ever happened. And they're so, so angry still when they get to work. An hour later, they walk into the office. And Betty says to Sally, Sally, how are you doing? Oh my God, you wouldn't believe what happened to me. I almost died in traffic. Well, what happened, Betty? Sally? Well, somebody cut in traffic in front of me. Well, are you okay now? Did you die? Oh, no, I didn't die. Then shut the fuck up then, Sally. That's what you feel like saying to her, right? But we all know someone who something happens in their life and they blow it up and they they're still and they, they talk about it for a decade. You know, and it's, like, it's and, and yes, there's healing and yes, there's things and right, but a general type of thing, a lot of people are reacting the things instead of responding instead of looking at things and be like how can i just consciously respond to this i learned this this is a long time of doing it right but like like you said there's that there's that gap there's that you call in this thing and then it takes a while to catch up it's the compound effect so i started doing this all at 21 i started becoming aware of my traumas becoming aware of all the anger in my life like i, I used, between the ages of 18 and 21 i used to spend at least probably two of my weekends out of the month locked up in the watch house from fighting and doing crazy shit because I was just an angry little shit. And and I started to become aware of all these things and work on my shit and become aware of people and, and understanding human behavior and psychology and neuroscience and all these things and um, working on my business and doing those types of things. So this has been a nine year journey in the making here. Hey guys, if this episode resonated with you, Please take a screenshot and share it to your Instagram stories and tag myself at a road less doubtful. And if you're ready to lean into the parts of you that have been hidden away and start your road to less doubt and have way more fun, I'd love for you to join our community of like-minded women who build each other up inside our free Facebook group. Tap the link in the show notes below and I can't wait to see you on the inside and travel this journey together. Yeah, but you're still a baby. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, what is, I think this has been good. I had a few other things, but I think you've given the people who will listen to this so much. I really do. And I know you're a busy man, so I don't want to hold you up too much longer. But if there was one thing that people could take away, so that starting point. Or that key thing, if they are at a moment where they don't feel like, you know, they can be grateful for that cup of coffee this morning because that just sounds like bullshit to them. What, what's that step? What is that first step? Forge Gibber, what the, would be a little piece of advice? The number one reason people don't achieve the things they want in their life is because they don't know what they want in their life. You said before, we grow up. We get a job, we do this thing, and become scared to do anything other than that. Because anything that threatens our identity, uh, we will um, we will defend, even if we know it's not for us. So when we say anything, I am, anything that throws the words, I am, will identify with. So if, if I say to the average person, who are you? They'll say, well, I'm a carpenter, I'm an accountant, I'm a worker, I'm a this, I'm a that. So when you start talking about, hey, creating extraordinary things in your life, it starts to threaten who they believe they actually are. So if they're not an accountant, not a lawyer, not an engineer, not a doctor anymore, who are they? And that is a scary question for a lot of people. And a better way to sort of look at it is to first get really clear on exactly what it is you want to create for your life, not your career, not who you think you are, 
but just you, you as this soul, you as this entity, you as this thing here, having an experience on earth, what experiences do you want to create? That That's the thing, you know, and knowing that you can morph into whatever your next chapter is, right? So the first thing I'd say is get extremely clear on exactly what you actually want to have, okay? What is it you actually want to get? Second thing I'd say is to get around people that also want similar things and then learn from somebody who has that thing. Figure out what you want, get around people that also want it because you'll have a collective belief, you know, without going so deep into this, but our beliefs will actually control all our behavior, okay? So if you are surrounded by 10 people that don't believe themselves, that don't believe in entrepreneurship, I keep coming back to business, so just insert whatever the goal is for the people listening, right? Um, if everyone around you doesn't believe that's possible, you'll share the collective belief. So what happens. We have collective beliefs based off what's happening around us. Our environment will literally, like energetically, we'll, we will... There's been there's been so many even tests done with this. That was, I'll share a really quick one. No, I'm not there was a whole group of monkeys. I forget which island. I need to do some more. I need to figure out the whole true story. I, I forget something, but there was this island. And what they realized was there was lots of sweet potatoes that would drop on this on this island. And the monkeys would start eating the sweet potatoes and they weren't really too fond of them. Like they would they'd take a bite, throw them away. Take a bite, throw them away. And then what the scientists did was they went and cleaned them in the ocean and gave it to the monkey and the monkey would fucking love it. And then what they did, is they started to take the, they, they took the sweet potatoes down to the ocean, washed it, made it salty, and then they would eat sweet potatoes all day long. So they figured out that, hey, hey, if we take it down to the ocean, we wash it, it gets salty, we actually like it. That's not the ex- exciting thing. The exciting thing is, I forget the number, but there's a certain number, okay, because on the other side of the island was all the other monkeys that didn't go through this experiment, but they also had sweet potatoes that they weren't enjoying. Once we hit a thing called critical mass, where a certain amount of the population on the one side of the island shared a collective belief, it actually transferred to the other group of monkeys. And they started to take their potatoes down to the water and wash their potatoes and do the exact same thing. No one told them how to do it. No one showed them how to do it. They just took it upon themselves. Now, what they've shown is the collective, right? How are we connected in the, in the breath, the cosmos, the 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 ether, or what whatever, right? We're all connected beings, and I don't think there's anything really to defend that one, right? We're we're all we're all connected, and so the importance of being around people that also want similar things to you is because you'll start to share their collective belief. So if you don't believe in yourself yet, that's okay. You don't need to have it. All you need to know is that the thing you want is believable, that it's possible for someone to attain, then if it's important enough to you, are you willing to learn the skill set and the mindset required to get there? And if you can share the collective belief of everybody else around you, that they're also sharing the same beliefs, that it's possible that they can learn the skills and they're committed to learning the skills, then you'll probably have a really good fighting chance as well. And maybe one day you'll wake up and have the whole life you wish that you can only dream of right now. So to sort of summarize that, get really clear on exactly what you want. Hold the belief that's possible. Get around people that are actually share the same beliefs as you and then invest in mentorship. Get a mentor, right? Learn from people that have done the things. This is why I run all these programs I run. Because like, dude, I've spent the last, I've invested nearly $300,000 in myself, done all the things myself and I, I give people a year's worth of coaching in a weekend. Yeah. It's like, I'd be okay with being the dumbest person in the room, right? That's one of the things I did for a long time. How can I be the dumbest and the poorest in every room I walk into? Yeah, I love your answer and I know I said I was going to let you go, but I feel like I want to add something if that's cool with you. Yeah. (laughs) Because what you were saying about the monkeys and actually everything you said, um, with working out what it is you want, I just had this just a couple of days ago where I was like, I don't know what it is. I do the values and I do the this and I do the that. And then someone asked me the question, they're like, is it that you don't know or that you don't think that it's a good enough answer? And I was like, oh, that was gold, right? Because for me, it's like things, adventure, freedom, travel, variety, like that's there, that's up there on my 
my top values. But I'm like, that doesn't make me a good person was the story because where's my family? Where's business? Where's all of these things that I had built my beliefs based on my childhood, based on however I became that person, whatever success used to look like to me, didn't have any of those words in it. So these things were just fun. They weren't grown up words. And I was like, oh, it doesn't feel important enough. How can I have purpose if these are my three things? Oh my God. But after I sort of thought about that and I went, well, hold on. Every time I do that, shit gets better. Things are more fun. I'm more ready to go. I love having conversations. Cool. So if I just hold on to that, why? Why do I have that belief? And it's then led into now I have a look at who I have around me. I'm like, these are those people and they don't judge me on that. I'm judging me on that. So I love that you said that, but I just wanted to add that part because sometimes we're doing it based on what other people have put in us, not what we really want. Definitely. If, if we're doing, if we're saying things to ourselves, I should do this, or I should do that, we'll should all over ourselves and we're taking on the ideas and opinions of the people around us. But your purpose in life will be found at the combination of two things. The things that you absolutely love and, then how, you can, <laughs> and then how you can be in service of other people mm. by doing those things you love. Yeah. Well, you can spend your life doing the things you absolutely love and then you find a way to add value to other people's lives. I really think we're here to help each other. I 100% and agree with you. So, so for you, it's just the idea if they're the things you love. Um, how- My brain's flowing at a million miles an hour this last couple yeah. of weeks. So you have no idea. It's insane. But the other thing, just real quick, is have you heard of the Oponopono prayer? Yeah, so I just feel like that's a very similar thing, right, to what you were saying with the monkeys because it's you saying that prayer, getting rid of that energy, negative, bad, whatever, omitting that and then putting it out there and whoever that's connected to breaks away. Oh, Give the idea. Me. Hello, hello, it's Emily here. You guys may have heard me talk about human design and will continue to do so throughout my podcast because it's helped me to expand my life using it as a tool along my journey. If you would like to take your first step on a road to less doubt, then download your own free personalized human design chart by clicking on the link in the show notes. Then as you follow along on socials or the podcast, you'll be able to integrate this and gain more clarity of who you are and remember who you came here to be. Lastly, I'd love for you to join our community of like-minded women inside our free Facebook group. All links are in the show notes. All right, back to the episode. The idea behind the whole Ho'oponopono is this. The story is the psychologist who created it, he was ancient Hawaiian Huna. Yeah. And he was number one number one psychologist in Hawaii. And they asked this psychologist, like, hey, can you we want you to come out to the prison because we can't keep a psychologist down here. Uh, this is the most out of control prison in all of Hawaii. Yeah. And you come here. And at first he turned it down and he's like, finally, they they nagged him, they got him out there. And what he did, he said, I don't want to see a single patient. All I want to see is all of their files. Bring me all of their files, close the door, leave me alone. <clears throat> and for like six or so months, these guys thought, like, this guy, we've paid for him to come down. He's meant to be the best. He's not doing anything. Because all he did was look at each individual file, open up rapists, murderers, and say the whole point upon it. I'm sorry. I love you. Please forgive me. Thank you. I'm sorry. I love you. Please forgive me. Thank you. But he wasn't saying it to them. This is the thing. coolest thing ever. So I'll come back to it in a second. But what happened was after about a year, all the violence in the prison lowered, uh, you know, the, the, the beatings, all the things that were happening inside the prison completely lowered. And he never saw a single patient. And this is where the whole perception is projection thing was actually born from the ancient ancient Hawaiian Huna. So what they believed is things only exist in your reality because it somehow exists in you. Now you might be like, whoa, I'm not a murderer. Sure. However, given the circumstances, could you commit murder? If somebody was to come and try and steal one of your kids and put a gun to their head, could you pick up a knife and put it through their head? Yeah. Probably. Probably. And then you'd be like, well, he fucking, you know what I mean? 
So because it exists inside of you, this, this is the depths of doing the work on ourselves, right? So what he did was he looked at all this and said, how come, how is this me? A really good question to ask. Anytime we're faced with things that uh, um, we're not happy with, we're done wrong by, someone's done bad things, we say, how is this person me? Mm-hmm. And we take, we take responsibility for other people's shitty actions and we say, how, how is this me? How have I created this? And then we forgive the parts of ourself that perhaps we haven't forgiven yet. And the idea is eventually it, it goes away. Because when we, when we heal the things inside of us, there's no emotional charge to it anymore. Because have, is there murders around? So yeah, probably, but they're not in my awareness. They're kind of my awareness. So I've done so much of these types of things around violence and blah, blah, blah. But when I was 18, I'd go out and all I would do is get into a fight. Like it follows me. Right? So that's kind of the idea of it. And I think everyone should, everybody can actually do that every single day. And, yeah. and say that, that whole point of, point of prayer to themselves and continually do self-healing. Imagine if everybody did that. Imagine if we hit the point of critical mass like the monkeys in the world. That's the interesting thing. Imagine what would happen yeah. to the rest of the world. I think that's an amazing space to stop in because if we can take some ownership on ourselves and then that forgiveness and like you said, what you see in others is it within you, the world would be such a better place and we would be freaking amazing. So on that note, thank you so, so much for today. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. Like you ran late. Apart from that, but other than that. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. And, you know, if um, if you people want to find us, the best place to find us is Instagram. Go to at Morgan T. Nelson or we've got a podcast as well, Dream Out Loud. Um, and actually, I've got a thing. We've just we've just created this thing. I've, I don't think I've told you. Like literally a couple of weeks ago, my team created this quiz and people can go through this quiz. So if they're feeling stuck or, or, or anything like that in life and they're like, what's my next thing? They can answer these questions, put in the quiz, and I'll spit them out an answer based off my four pillars. And then it gives them a customized training video um, to help them sort of have that breakthrough. So I can send that to you as well. And um, you people can check that out. It's, it's pretty cool. Amazing. Well, we will link it. You can obviously tell this is like my second one and I had no idea what I was supposed to say at the end. So Morgan did a shout out to himself, which is amazing because he's good enough to do that. But I can vouch for that because I've been to a few of his events and I've heard him speak. So go and check him out. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye.